morning guys if everybody can make their way in grab a seat and uh, we'll get the program started and so everybody can get started on their busy day today All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first, just like to thank everybody for coming out to our first program of the year. Thank you for braving the uh, cold weather. Uh, my name is Kevin Brangers. I'm your uh, chapter president for 2016, so you're stuck with me for a whole year. So hopefully it'll be a good relationship for us all. But uh, again, thanks for being here. I think we've got an exciting program set up today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Michael and Leo for setting this thing up. And <clears throat> Michael's going to do the introduction of uh, Michael and Mitch here in just a second. 
And but just some uh, announcement of some upcoming events. The next meeting that we're having will be on March 10th. It's going to be at the Georgia Chamber of Commerce. And Chris Clark, the uh, CEO, will be the uh, our guest speaker moderator for that event. And that's going to be a luncheon event. Uh, we have not uh, determined the venue yet. Uh, the chamber only has uh, approximately about 40 people that can fit there. So we're going to look at some other venues to see if we can increase that. Uh, for anybody that's taking the exam uh, this April, we do have our candidate review session that's coming up starting March 1. Uh, our candidate guidance uh, committee chairs here, uh, right there in the back, Liz uh, Luttrell, she's here. So if you know anybody that needs to sign up, uh, please get with her or give me a call and we'll get you the right information on that. Uh, our first uh, CI course this year is 101. This is going to be held March 14th through the 17th. So if you know anybody that's uh, you know looking to get into the CCIM world, let them know that 101 is here in Atlanta. And again, Atlanta will offer all four courses this year. Uh, 102 will be in April, and then we'll do 101 again in August, and then three and four will be in September and October, and we'll get those dates out in our various newsletters. Uh, this year's mid-year meeting is going to be in Chicago again. They moved it uh, for us here in Atlanta and Georgia, a little bit different. It's going to be Master's Week, which is uh, April 4th through the 6th. Uh, Again, in Chicago, and the exam will be there as well. Uh, the, one of the biggest things uh, that I want to make sure everybody here has on your calendar, as you probably know, and if you don't know, this year, the Fall Thrive Conference, which is our big meeting, CCIM Institute, is here in Atlanta. It's going to be from the 24th through the 28th. And the big event always for this is the, the chapter, the local chapter, state chapter hosts the major networking event. So your Georgia chapter will be hosting uh, the networking event, which is going to be on Tuesday, October 25th, and it is scheduled for the College Football Hall of Fame. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, we've got our committee planning it now. Everything's pretty much uh, set on that, and there'll be more information coming out on that. Uh, two more things. Uh, your parking validation, as you know, they put up parking gates. But having this, having this room, we will validate your parking. So when you leave here, go to the security desk out front, and they'll stamp it for you. That way you don't have to pay for your parking. And then also, we've got a sponsor table set up out in the lobby. So please stop by there and pick up uh, some of the information left there by our sponsors. Uh, and then obviously, a big thank you to our 2016 sponsors, because events like this and everything that we have planned this year cannot happen without these guys support so if you're in the if you're out there looking for a service these guys provide please give them a call and give them a look but this year's platinum sponsors Marcus and Millichap Bull Realty the Simpson company Kitchens Kelly Gaines our silver sponsor is going to be Adams Realtor the commercial real estate show commercial experts first colony financial corp first citizens bank national property inspectors Northwestern Mutual, Renaissance Bank, Standard Landscape, Stout, Kaiser & Hendrick LLP, Strategic Exchange Advisors, and Telnet Connection. And with that, I'm going to end and let Michael come up and introduce our uh, guest today and get the show going. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, good morning. You'll be in for a real treat today. We have a couple of rock stars with us. <laughs> As you know, our own Michael Bull, who's an active commercial real estate advisor and nationally syndicated radio show host here from Atlanta, as CEO of Bull Realty, headquartered here. Michael has closed over $4 billion in acquisitions, disposition, and leasing assignments over a 30-year career. Executive producer and host of the commercial real estate show, he is heard by millions around the country on 47 radio stations, iTunes, YouTube, and the show website, www.creshow.com. Welcome, Michael. 
In from Manhattan, we have Mitch Rochelle. Mitch is a U.S. National Practice Leader for PwC's Real Estate Advisory Practice. As one of the co-founders of this practice, Mitch has over 25 years of experience performing due diligence reviews on behalf of real estate investors, lenders, and asset managers. He is regularly used on the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and Bloomberg. He is a regular contributor on CNBC, Fox Business Network, and the Commercial Real Estate Show. Welcome, Mitch. Michael Mitch. Round of applause. Poor Michael. <laughs> Being here, and um, I have the opportunity doing my show to interview really real estate scholars, economists, and leading analysts around the country. And uh, Mitch has been one of our regular contributors on the show, and, and his insight and forecast and, and kind of the things that impact our industry, I've always enjoyed. So I uh, appreciate uh, you being here. Thanks, Michael. I'm not a I'm none of the above. I'm not a scholar. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I'm insightful, though. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. Well, Mitch, my first question for you is: you know, times are good. They've been good, and but we've had some stock market volatility. You know, we've had some issues around the world with the economy. Uh, we've seen interest rates maybe ticking up a little bit. Uh, where are we? How long will the good times last? The big, best question. Am I supposed right? to break into song now or something <laughs> like that? So I knew Michael was going to ask me this question, so I had hours to prepare. Oh, I'm supposed to answer it. So my, my standard answer is, because I get the question what inning it is, and he didn't ask me what inning it is, but so my standard answer is we're sort of in the middle of a double header, um, so that gets me out of having to say what inning it is. But what's interesting is it's probably harder to answer today than it was maybe in October or November when you asked me for the first time on your show, because then while there were potential headwinds out there, it felt more tailwindy than headwind, um, and the only thing that was really going on at the time was interest rates and what a Fed action may do and so forth. Well, I just saw a tweet from CNBC. The 10-year is at the lowest level since 2012 and is at 155. So that's a tailwind. Um, the bubble feeling was driven by foreign capital coming to the United States from, amongst other places, China, and that's not happening. Um, sovereign wealth funds, many of whom are oil-rich nations, they were investing in U.S. real estate. That doesn't seem like it's happening. So um, we're really at an interesting point from a um, capital flows perspective. Uh, I did a similar thing in New York, and I had two big brokers in New York um, who do you know billion-dollar transactions. And I said, what's this year look like? And they said, well, we have less listings signed up in January than we've had in the last four or five years. And everybody actually thought that that was a good thing, right? So. Um, Reinflating the bubble is the thing that scares a lot of market participants, and maybe this uncertainty that's going around the world um, is actually good for real estate in that it's not going to sort of get us into bubble territory. The question you didn't ask, and maybe that's like number 19 on your list, um, but what's going on with the economy, and is the economy really slowing down, are we, and we're, are we in a recession? So maybe we could tackle that one. Uh, when you get around to asking it. But the, from a bubble perspective, from an inning perspective, I think we're probably in a good place because it was getting, what did Greenspan call it, economic exuberance. We don't have that going on in real estate right now with people just stupidly throwing money at the asset class, and maybe that's good from a bubble perspective. Well, what do you say to the people who suggest that uh, these three and four cap rates, sometimes lower in some of these gateway markets that people are paying for, these core assets is is too high because of the low cost of money uh, that when interest rates do rise they're going they've got to go up at some point right uh, that they may be overpaying um, I'd argue um, in gateway markets that cap rate compression was driven by supply and demand of product there was supply of capital 
Uh, there was demand for product. Uh, there wasn't enough of it, so people were just driving on cap rates. Um, but all those people who were labeled stupid because they paid a three cap were geniuses when NOIs grew in those markets, especially in multifamily, and then that three that they paid a year ago economically became a five, right? So there was all of this um, market clearing price that looked crazy, and then all of a sudden this instant gratification because they look smart. Uh, and then what did investors do? Those gateway markets got too crowded, so they went to other places in the country, and then they started doing the same thing, and then they were validated there. Um, so I, I, I think, and I try to, when I speak publicly, never use the words cap rate, right? and you just baited me into it. But um, I, I, I would suggest that cap rate compression will happen less going forward. And we published the sh little shameless plug. We published a PwC Real Estate Investor Survey four times a year, and we survey investors. The next one's coming out, and we're definitely seeing in investors' eyes the slowdown in cap rate compression. So um, I think that's what your question was, people just throwing money at stuff and driving down cap rates. That's going to happen less, probably because there's less capital chasing it. And we're going to – but, but what we will find is investors leaving – raising capital and leaving it on the sidelines – because they're worried about the future and sooner or later those toes will get back in the water and we'll be back in this thing again so and mitch you mentioned noi growth and in some of these properties even these low cap rate properties what are the things causing that and we're now seeing that you know, in atlanta so like our office market rents are are finally increasing all the office landlords are, are clapping right yeah. doing the snoopy dance finally uh by yeah. the way he <laughs> says snoopy dance all the time <laughs> and he says it when i'm on his radio slash TV show slash podcast slash everything, but he's wired into the seat. Now you only have one. I want to see that Snoopy dance one day. Well, I'd like to it. see you get up <laughs> it goes like this. and have your ears flapping. <laughs> <laughs> so what is called, what is this expected to continue? And is it the uh, lack of new supply? Is it the kind of built-in uh, rate growth and rent growth? Or are some of these folks paying some of these low cap rates even for properties in Atlanta that we might think are, are kind of low cap rates for Atlanta, is it the rate growth that, that may be built in because they haven't gotten the rent increases yet that are, the market's getting? Yes. Well, it's 140 characters or less. And so interestingly enough, we haven't in the, in the United States added meaningfully to the supply of office stock since the 80s. And if you look at when in that decade – we added to office stock. It was mostly in the front end of the 80s before the Tax Reform Act of 86 and the ultimate savings and loan crash. So we don't really have new supply. We're adding new supply of office stock at a rate, depending on markets, right, a rate of about 1.5% of all supply a year. Um, and we have 1940s and 30s vintage office stock in this country, and maybe to a lesser degree in Atlanta, but in other cities you have more of it. So um, if you increase demand, and I have this great chart that you can't see because it's in my head and it's not behind me, but there's been a precipitous rise in office using job employment. So if you look at all the job growth that exists in this country, it's not manufacturing jobs. It's mostly service jobs, um, and a good portion of the service jobs are office using jobs. So we've meaningfully added to office using jobs in this country, and we haven't added new supply of office space. One other little fact, which is maybe a little bit of a headwind, and I just did a blog post on it on LinkedIn the other day. You can like it. And do you, no, that's that, like this very Facebooky, yeah, right? That's, that's oh, that Facebook, didn't LinkedIn yeah. change it to a thumbs up? They did, you LinkedIn people. So what's interesting is the paradigm of 250 square feet per worker is kind of a maybe pre-2000s thing. By 20. Uh, 20, the forecast is less than 150 square feet per empo employee. I think it's down to 138. So um, I've always sort of joked that, and especially when I look at our offices, I know why um, that big technology company that's a brand of fruit, I'm trying to go brand agnostic, they bought a headphone company. The reason why they bought a headphone company is every office worker has headphones on because they're trying to drown out the ambient noise of the office because they're sitting next to somebody. Um, so that's what's happening. We're just jamming more and more stuff. Um, I don't know about your offices, but like in Midtown Manhattan, toilet paper runs out at like 1130 in, in the stalls. Uh, is this tape for broadcast? <laughs> You're live. Oh, no. 
Hi, hi, mom and dad. Uh, in any event, so but the the fact of the matter is, we're just jamming so much stuff into these buildings; it's not sustainable. So inevitably, we're going to have to add to supply. But if we're not, and we have all this demand, then rate, rate, rents have to grow. So I think there's a strong tailwind for. Um, office, and we can talk about multifamily because I know that's on your list too, but the strong um, talent for multifamily for office. The only challenge with that is if corporate um, budget process worries about a recession, they're less likely to enter into a new lease right now. Um, I think if we get through some of this uncertainty in the market and we don't experience uh, a quarter of negative GB. GDP growth or maybe another quarter of negative GDP growth and people realize that maybe it's just like a little auto correction and it's not a real recession, then corporate budgeters will potentially say, all right, we need to expand in more space. But we need, we desperately need people in new space because the model we have is unsustainable. And the lack of new supply that, that you mentioned, you know, it seems to be another uh, factor impa impacting that and that's the rising cost of construction. You know, a lot of the people that we work with are, are they're putting a, at least a 1% increase in their construction costs for every 30 days of delay of a project. How might the rising labor costs and construction costs impact our commercial real estate industry? It, 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 it has to, right? So what's interesting is you look at projects and you compare projects that are existing to what can you buy this thing for as a percentage of reproduction cost. The problem is the reproduction cost is messed up because it's actually costing a lot more to build these things. And we've got appraisers in a room, so you're pulling out a book and trying to figure out what the cost approach is. The fact of the matter is it's just costing a lot more, um, which is interesting because when economists, and full disclosure, I am not an economist, but when economists talk about jobs and wage, they always talk about construction jobs and the lack thereof, yet construction costs are going up in a period where commodity prices aren't going up. So it's not materials, it's clearly labor. Um, and the housing market is recovering uh, meaningfully. So we've got cr construction jobs there. We have a basically a skilled labor shortage in this country and that skilled labor shortage is what's contributing to the construction cost increase. But I think the pace at which construction costs are rising isn't sustainable because margins are still tight in, in the business, so. What well, is this rising cost in, in labor and construction, is that gonna help commercial real estate values for the investors in the room? For existing product, you mean? Yes, that, right, absolutely. But we'd have to recalibrate, again, what that existing project really is trading at as a percentage of new construction and realize that new construction replacement value is going up. Okay. and. We hear interest rates are going to rise. Is there a commercial break, Michael? No, and there's no bathroom break either. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how old this building is. There may be no toilet paper left. <laughs> Second time I made that reference, by the way. <laughs> Michael's finding all this funny. I don't know about the rest. Can I say y'all down here? Yes, Is this y'all territory? You say yous, we say y'all. I don't really no. say yous because I'm from an outer borough, but not one of the two that says yous. Yeah. It's yous, not yous. Oh. But so it's y'all? You ones or y'all? You can I say all y'all too? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. got it. We're the grits. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that as CCIMs, when we're doing analysis uh, of ownership of a property, you know, we're looking at exit cap rates, and whether we're looking at exit cap rates in, in five years or, or ten years, uh, but we're trying to figure out exit cap rates. So, what would you say the uh, impact of rising interest rates, say, over the next three, four, five, six years, uh, could do to commercial real estate values? I, I, I'm almost getting to the point where I, I'm not bought into the notion that rates are rising. So, Japan has negative interest. I don't even know what a negative interest rate is. How is that even possible? Who's paying who, right? So, we're actually, you're paying the central bank to hold on to your money? Is that what a negative interest rate is? So um, I think we're in a global long-term cycle of low interest rates. Um, I'm not gonna guess what the Fed's gonna do the next time they get together, but if all of this nonsense uncertainty is going on out, out there, I wouldn't see them raising rates. And the 10 year, it's, it's big, at least the shorter end of the curve, 155. So maybe 
all of this, let's assume interest rates is going up, is just a flawed assumption. Um, so I reject your question, Michael Bull. Um, um, so what was your question anyway? <laughs> <laughs> so if the interest rate would hopefully rise yeah. in the next five years, right? I guess we hope the economy strengthens and the Fed raises their rate uh, because we are seeing a good. Oh, cheap. exit caps. Yes. There, there. <laughs> Um, there has to be some difference between going in and exit caps. It just absolutely makes sense. Um, but I just think it's um, it's probably going to be tighter because if we see um, interest rates going up, I think it's going to be these little 25 basis point moves, um, and it's not really going to meaningfully move the needle. So, yeah, exit caps need to clearly be higher. That's crazy, right? You're looking at 10-year cash flows, and we're in a low interest rate environment, and you got to figure 10 years from now – Interest rates are higher, um, but no one's really figured that out. And when we ask that question in our second shameless plug, PwC Real Estate Investor Survey, when we when we do that, um, there's crazy answers all over the place about what exit cap should be. I don't, I'd say there's not a lot of consensus around that um, because while everybody everybody you ask, if I did a show of hands, who thinks interest rates could be higher a year from now? Everybody's going to raise their hands. Then if I say how much higher, I'll have a hundred different answers. Right. So no one. We fundamentally think rates are going up, but we no one feels comfortable pegging where it is. So maybe 25, 50 basis points ends up becoming the right spread between, you know, where we are today and where cap rates will be 10 years from now. What would you expect the correlation to be between interest rates and cap rates? Right? I thought it's I not, said I didn't want to talk about <laughs> cap rates. It's not one-to-one, one one, right? You no. Know, there's other factors that are going to... Right, no, because the cap rates widen. I, I think cap rates are a function of supply and demand of capital. Uh, that's what drives cap rates. And interest rates are moved by a completely different set of macroeconomic forces. So they theoretically are independent of one another. And, and here's the crazy thing. So REITs got the snot kicked out of them. Is that allowed on your 47 radio stations? Beep, they beeped it out. Oh, they beeped it out. Okay. So um, REITs just got beaten up last year. Because a lot of retail buyers of REIT shares bought them because they thought that they were a fixed income and alternative, and they were bailing because they thought that the yields were going to change. But the fundamentals for real estate are still strong. In fact, if you did a survey of REIT shareholders and you asked them what the first two letters in REIT stand for, I don't know how many would even know that it stands for real estate. Okay, real, I'm serious. They just know that it's a – I use my 90-year-old father as a proxy for all of this stuff, and I think he does because he watches his son on television. The funny thing is my dad will, like, corner me in the kitchen when I'm cooking something, and he goes, what do you think of REITs? And I'm like, terrible. Don't buy them. And he goes, but you were just on, like, Maria Bartiromo's show talking about them. And I said, I don't want you to buy them. <laughs> okay. I'm not talking about America. I'm talking about you because <laughs> I don't really want to have to clean up the mess that, <laughs> that gets made. So, But the fact of the matter is um, I think people view – retail investors view real estate as a fixed income alternative, so they behave that way. But the fundamentals of real estate really don't work that way. Um, so I don't think that there's this correlation. I think that if real estate fundamentally makes sense. So I said office fundamentally makes sense because we're grow growing office employment demand, and we haven't added to stock supply. And when supply and demand dynamics work that way, that's good fundamentals, right, I guess. And I can say the same thing for multifamily and give you a whole bunch of numbers to support that hypothesis. So if the fundamentals are strong, then cap rates should, capital should find its way to the asset class and cap rates should stay low regardless. And I'll give you another little interesting nugget from for those of you familiar with emerging trends in real estate, which we publish uh, jointly with the Urban Land Institute. So every year we ask investors, what are the, what's your feeling on sentiment? And the way we ask the question is, what do you think the prospects for profitability for real estate are for the following year? Um, this last year we did it, the positive sentiment was 84%. So 84 out of 100 people thought the prospects for profitability for the upcoming year, the one we're in, 2016, were good to excellent. The year prior, it was like 74%. We also asked them, what is the likelihood that interest rates will grow in the following year? And almost the same number, about 84% said yes. So how is it possible with an interest rate sensitive asset class of real estate that people thought profitability was rising when rates were rising? That just intuitively doesn't make sense if the cost of capital just went up. So clearly the real estate industry feels that the fundamentals are stronger from a 
tailwind perspective than the headwind of rising um, cost of capital. So I don't think that there's a correlation between the performance of the asset class and the cost of capital. And by the way, all of those times when we added meaningfully to supply of real estate that created bubbles, we did it in a period when rates were two, three, or four times higher than they are today. Tell the audience about the sentiment uh, in your emerging trends report and how it compares to what year was it? Oh, oh six, six. Six. Yeah. I thought you were talking about sentiment in the bottom of red wine. <laughs> oh, spelled differently. Um, that was a very classy reference that some people got. In any event, so in 2006, we got the same. The pie chart was exactly the same as it is today, um, where 84% of the folks felt that the prospects for profitability were good to excellent at 84%. Exactly. Or remember my cousin Vinny? Identical. <laughs> no. No, no, my, my cousin, any reference, nothing. Really, isn't that from here? Sort of. Is it? So, All y'all. <laughs> so that's a little scary, huh? The same exact. Same. Exact. Yes. Sentiment. Yeah. So we're all exuberant. Yes. Doing, as Michael would say, the Snoopy dance. Yeah. yeah. But the fundamentals, I think, are totally different. What had happened in, 19, in 2006, capital was just like coming out of water faucets, right? And. Um, you couldn't create a chart showing how much dry powder was on the sidelines because there was no dry powder on the sidelines. You got money, you bought something. You got money, you bought something. And uh, that's not going on today. We have private equity that's um, getting pushback from limited partners because they've raised capital and they haven't spent it. We have REITs that have cash on the balance sheet at a record amount. Um, we have pension funds in open-ended funds that aren't selling assets because their fear is if they sell the asset and you know clear a price that's you know at a you know two cap, they can't find a product to replace it with, and they don't want the cash on the balance sheet. So um, I don't think we have fundamentals today that are um, or market dynamics today that are even close to what the market dynamics were pre-financial crisis. Also, the debt levels are different, right? Uh, personal debt level. Well, listen, if you're buying a home, you actually need a down payment today that's crazy you need a down payment to buy a home if you and, and by the way i was around because i'm older than i look okay but i, I was around before in, in every one of these recessions two of by the way two of the last four recessions were caused by real estate okay um but the one in late um when the cmbs market blew up in what 98 or 90 nine around that time frame when there was that russian bond crisis and the hedge fund failed and cmbs market blew up the CMBS world was doing 100% loan-to-value loans. And before the financial crisis, the CMBS market was doing 100% loan-to-value loans. I worked on the bankruptcy of 100, over 100% loan-to-value loan. And uh, that just doesn't go on today. In the CMBS world, you need a down payment. In the residential mortgage origination world, you need a down payment. So that's a good product. The first time in 30 years I've seen profound discipline in both the commercial real estate and the residential real estate markets. So. Let's, let's ask you about uh, foreign investment in the U.S. We've seen a lot of foreign investment, uh, even here uh, in Atlanta, through some of the, the uh, local sponsors. Coming from where? Can I ask you questions? From all over the world. Oh. And uh, so the changes in FERPTA that happened in December, uh, do you think that will increase the flow of foreign investment in the U.S., and may that, might that impact cap rates and values? Um, if foreigners were investing, let's talk about taxable foreigners, so non-sovereign wealth funds. If taxable foreigners were investing in U.S. real estate when they were paying a tax, um, when they repatriate their money, um, and you take away some of those tax disincentives, you would assume all things being equal, you would assume that that would improve the flow of capital from foreign investors. I think we're probably going to see a little bit of a seed change between who has been investing in U.S. real estate as a foreigner um, because China is probably going to lower their allocation to U.S. real estate. Um, do you, does this audience know who the number one investor, foreign investor in U.S. real estate is? Anybody guess? Canada. Who said Canada? Big prize. Yeah, that maple syrup money. <laughs> that was the best thing I said all morning. Maple syrup money, and I got nothing out of it. Um, so why? They're our neighbor. 
Okay, that's number one reason. And number two, so we went and spent time looking at foreign investment in U.S. real estate over the last 200 years. You know who we've always, who the biggest investors in foreign, biggest foreign investors in U.S. real estate are? Our trading partners. And if you look at the U.S. investment abroad, U.S. investors investing in real estate, we tend to invest in our trading partners. It just seems to make sense. So if that's the dynamic that's going on for 200 years, why would one piece of tax legislation meaningfully change that? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to move the needle that much. That's my non-tax practitioner. Probably need a circular 230 reference under what I just said. A few three counts in the room. You got that one. Yeah. Now, Mitch, you look at uh, property values around the world, around the country, uh, especially the major markets a lot. So I'm interested in what you think about Atlanta real estate. I love Atlanta real estate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The Chamber of Commerce gave me a free cup of coffee when I walked in. Um, Atlanta's got, and they're down here someplace. I could have memorized them, but that would require advanced prep on my part. But um, Atlanta's got the highest net immigration numbers between 2000. This is like Census Bureau and Moody's analytics numbers uh, between 2016 and 20. I think it's 90,000 people moving to Atlanta on a net basis, which makes it, from a net immigration perspective, the biggest uptick of any city in the United States. Those are damn Yankees, is what we call them. I don't know what the hell that meant. <laughs> He's speaking this crazy southern language. Another question I think a lot of us here, especially the brokers in the room, is that some of our investors sometimes look at the election, upcoming presidential election, and they think, oh, boy, the, the world's going to end uh, <laughs> if, uh, if we have a socialist president. You know, if you look back at, at history, uh, has the – presidential election impacted commercial real estate and the economy in a big way? The election itself, probably not. Um, what's interesting is we did, we actually did a thing once upon a time. Um, we looked at uh, Republicans and Democrats or blues or reds or any of that. We looked at Congress. We looked at who was in the Oval Office and what happened with the economy as it relates to real estate. And there was nothing, there was no car. It was just like, it was, and one argument could be made that um, an administration would have to be eight years in order to really move the needle from an economic perspective, and that would require the Oval Office and Cong both houses of Congress to be in the same political party. Like, none of that ever happens, um, so we, we haven't seen it. Um, and I also haven't really heard uh, any rhetoric around tax law changes that would – or regulatory changes that would really help. Um, Listen, the, the last thing that happened coming out of Washington that changed the real estate world was the deregulation of savings and loan industry, which meaningfully changed real estate from a funding perspective. And some of us in the room are old enough to remember when that happened. And then the Tax Reform Act of 1986. Other than that, there really hasn't been something from a policy perspective that has had an unbelievably overwhelming impact on real estate proactive something that happened from a legislation perspective that changed the needle. There have been things that administrations have done to respond. You may like it or you don't. I'm staying out of the politics of it. But when the financial crisis happened, government had to respond, okay? Um, when the savings and loan crisis blew up, you know, government had to respond um, and central bankers and so forth. But from a policy perspective, I don't think so. So we, we – that was a really – I could have done it 140 characters, but – you know, I'm getting paid by the minute here, okay? But don't see it. Don't see the election doing anything. Okay, so no contingencies and contracts on who gets elected, please. I don't want to see that. Uh, this Just year. the appropriations clause if yeah. it's a government agency that is your tenant. I would throw that in there. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we're seeing uh, is technology uh, impacting every industry, including commercial real estate. There's been a, a lot of money invested in, in CRE tech. Uh, what impact do you think technology will have on, on the commercial real estate industry? In terms of disrupting it, I'm waiting for the shoe to drop to have the real estate industry disrupted the way every other industry has gotten disrupted by technology. Um, I, my case study is the yellow taxi business in New York or whatever color your traditional taxis are here in, in Atlanta and how they got disrupted by one or two online um, mobile app taxi alternatives. Um, the lodging industry has been disrupted twice. 
Um, the creation of what we refer to as opaque sites where you can go online and book a hotel room without having to, you know, call the hotel or use that brand's website, right? So that was a disruptor. And then this whole Airbnb concept, a disruptor. But when is commercial real estate going to get disrupted that way? And I would say that the space in which technology may find, if, if we're overcrowding office spaces, um, there's maybe a play there where somehow there'll be a disruptor that'll fix that problem. Alternatively, and this is something that most people don't know, and I found it interesting, we created in this country in the last five years five times more jobs with companies that have 49 employees or less than companies that have 1,000 employees or more. And if we believe that job creation is the secret sauce that drives the real estate economy forward, we've been looking at the wrong companies because it's small companies. Small companies creating jobs and needing space are the sweet spot for some s disruptor in the commercial real estate area. I'm just talking about the office subsector, maybe light industrial. So there's something that's going to happen there. Um, it's probably just going to disrupt um, the brokerage world more than it'll disrupt the landlord world, I think, though. And you, and Is that you, even responsive to his question, or was I just rambling? At, <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned the, a little bit about the sharing economy, and I guess how that's impacting some of the commercial. Swipe to the left. Commercial real estate. These uh, references are going nowhere in Atlanta. Maybe it's too uh, early. It is. <laughs> we haven't had our, all our coffee yeah. yet, right? So what about the sharing technology and the sharing economy that we have now? Might that impact commercial real estate or one of the sectors or? I, normally, I don't use brands when I um, speak because I have like a I'm shrouded by PR people who like hit me with a taser if I do. Um, but I moderated a panel, and the CEO of a big REIT was the uh, guest on the panel, or one of them. I think maybe the largest office REIT in the country, and he said that the biggest tenant uh, for his space when RFPs went out for space was WeWork. Right. So I looked into that and other companies like that. That's a model from a sharing economy perspective. So if you have a whole bunch of different companies working together, none of whom can afford a 3D printer, but one exists in the space and they need a 3D printer for what they do. I think we're going to see that sharing economy um, taking place because I'm going to go back to my answer to the previous question. Forty nine employees or less, if that's who's driving the economy forward. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I remember working on this feasibility study in the 80s for something called a business incubator that was a really cool idea and went nowhere but I guess somebody dusted off that business plan and called it something different and launched it like five years ago that's where we're gonna see that in office space uh, and we're gonna probably see it in the home ownership space as well where people who physically want to be in a home but may maybe can't afford it themselves we may see some shared economy in terms of the home ownership business too so. Okay, and you mentioned office space and the office sector and some of the technology and changes going on. You mentioned uh, lower square footage per employee, uh, you know, and, and people working at home and all of that. So what, so what do you expect about the office market moving forward, and, and what are some of the factors that may impact it? Um, oil, right? So the, I guess a couple of things. This whole – Suburban, suburban, people moving back to the suburbs. I was trying to invent a word and it just didn't work. Um, but people moving back to the suburbs, um, traffic on your Georgia 400s and your 285s and your 40s. Did I get all your roads? Yeah, right? traffic. Yeah. yeah. I left early enough this morning. It was still dark out, so I didn't experience it. But I did watch local news and there was already congestion. So um, road congestion is an issue. Will driverless cars show up? Um, is the suburban office model dead? But all of this in a period where we're now buying gasoline for $2 a gallon again, right? So um, I think that there's going to be something going on there in terms of office space. Um, I get this question all the time, is suburban office dead? Uh, because there's all this urban, urbanization going on in this country. People want to work, live, work, play, and that doesn't really work when you get stuck to a car. Another fun fact I'll give you, the application rate for driver's licenses in this country amongst Americans 25 years and older, it, younger rather, is at the lowest rate it's been in modern U.S. history. Okay, 
crazy. All right, I've got soon to be sixteen year olds that like can't wait to get their driver's license, which scares the ever living hell out of me. Just them on the road. They can't even drive a golf cart. <laughs> I let one of my kids drive my boat for a second. I was like just taking the fenders off and I was like, Sam, do me a favor, keep the bow pointed at that red buoy and just don't move. Like I'm just just hold the wheel. I'm gonna go run around the boat and take the fenders off. I look up for a second, and we're headed into, like, a jetty. We're about to die, and he's Snapchatting. <laughs> I'm driving Dad's boat. Let's take pictures of it like an idiot, okay? I don't want that kid behind the wheel of a car. I'm just throwing that out there, okay? You don't want that kid behind the wheel of a car. But in any event, so is suburban office dead? Well, here's the other thing. Who lives in the suburbs? Um, people who are getting older. And all I can tell you, people, the older you get, the more times you go to a doctor a week, okay? So suburban office in a lot of metro areas across the country are just filling up with medical office uses. Um, so, I, again, you ask questions, and I barely listen to them and just say whatever the hell I want. But I think that there's a big shift going on in terms of where we live, where we play, where we go to the doctor, how we commute, and it's going to sort of have a, a big effect on sort of offices and where people live and so forth, which I don't think people have really figured out. Um, the millennials, and I've like had to go on a nationwide speaking tour to apologize to millennials because I blamed them for the drop in the home ownership rate until I pulled up this cool chart that showed me that the home ownership rate has dropped for all ages across the country. Having said that, there's a lot of data that suggests that the leading edge of the millennial cohort is actually buying homes for the first time. And where are they doing it? In the suburbs. And why are they doing it in the suburbs? Because they want to get out of the city because they're worried about the education for their kids. So if all of this stuff is happening, then we're back to the 80s and 70s and history is just going to repeat itself and all of the uses and all the places where real estate is will make sense again. So it's all Gen X's fault, by the way. That's what I'm blaming now. And I want to talk some more about some of the various uh, sectors. But if you were going to invest in commercial real estate today and you could invest in any sector, which sector would you prefer? Limited service hotels. I just made that up. <laughs> um, because if you think about it, um, RevPAR, Revenue Per Available Room, has grown for like the last six years at – over 5%, and GDP in no year has grown by more than 3%. So easy math, RevPAR growth, top line, a lot of that falls to the bottom line, but not all, okay? But RevPAR has grown at twice the rate of GDP in the last five years, and we haven't meaningfully added to supply. Um, where does RevPAR not all fall to the bottom line? In full-service hotels. So it just seems to make sense that limited-service hotels uh, located in the right spots do well. All of the big brands are experimenting with new, cool, sexy brands in the limited-service hotel space. Um, and when you talk to them about the expansion of that brand, the thing that scares them the most is they just can't find owners who want to take the risk and build. So, and they don't want to use their balance sheet up to do it because that's not their business model. So I think there's an opportunity for new construction, new development of limited service hotel, as well as, um, and by the way, there are I'll take a brand new limited service hotel sometimes over a like 40 year old full service hotel. Um, and sometimes when I'm traveling and I try to find one, they're full. And because the occupants in those hotels tend to be very sticky and their stays tend to be longer. Because um, the other big macro trend that's going on in this country is less full-time employment and more independent contractor employment. Um, so these long projects that independent contractors often work on are on the road, and where do they stay? They stay in limited service hotels. So this Did you my bring answer. your checkbook? We have a hotel broker here. Of I course. Think. You so, have a hotel. Okay. Is he a bull realty guy? <laughs> no, he's not. But Interesting. He's a CCIM, though, Georgia right. chapter member. All right. So what do you think about the industrial sector? Um. I think the, the what's interesting is in our emerging trends work for uh, the last three years, maybe four, uh, industrial was the number one um, sub-asset class in, in the eyes of investors from an opportunity perspective. 
what's happened now in those four years is where the industrial is has shifted. Four years ago, if I was sitting here talking about industrial, I'd say the problem is we have all this old, antiquated industrial. The ceilings aren't high enough. The bays aren't big enough. This isn't this. This isn't that. And I'd also talk about where it needed to be located because everybody wanted industrial that was near rail lines because diesel was four and a half, almost five dollars a gallon. And people were using rail to ship bananas across the country or whatever it was. Okay. Now diesel's two and a half bucks, although boat gas is still going to be five dollars a gallon, but that's besides the point. But um, I don't know about what you, I don't know, you probably have like big red jugs and you fill it up yourself. <laughs> Make it he fun. knows me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I've made that joke about you before on the air. But, um, but the fact of the matter is, industrials change because industrial needs to be all about last mile delivery of online stuff. Um, so in my building in Manhattan where I work, um, we have about seven, 8,000 people who work in our building. And between the beginning of November, but certainly from Thanksgiving to our Christmas holiday break, um, the poor dude on my floor who pushes around a cart only pushes around stuff that was bought online because all of our employees, what do they do? They ship stuff to the office. True story, a dude on my floor bought a 60-inch flat screen and had to ship to the office. Because wherever he lived in Manhattan or Brooklyn or wherever he lived in the New York metropolitan area, he didn't want to ship the thing there because there was nobody to sign for it. Okay? Um, like people send me bottles of wine. Not Michael, but people, you know, like, so I get a bottle of wine, I get shipped to the house. What do I have to do? I have to contact UPS and have them reship it to the office because if there's nobody signed for it, they just won't leave wine at the door. Um, so offices have become the receiving departments for all of our online stuff. So that poses a problem for landlords and property managers and so forth. But if that's where they're getting delivered, where's the warehouse that they're coming from? So we've created this urbanization of industrial. So in New York, um, every office building of a certain vintage has like three to four stories below sea level that, because New York's really built that sea level, Manhattan is, um, that are really unrentable because they used to be places where records were retained, not like 33 and a third <laughs> vinyl, but we're doc now we no longer store documents there and landlords can't rent them. Some of that space is being repurposed for um, where to stick the stuff that people and so there's this new urban industrial trend that's going on and you know there's two reasons why that space exists below sea level one is it was paper record retention the other thing it was built for fallout shelters who's here is old enough to remember what don't, that is hope we don't okay. need that so my point about industrial is i think you have to look at it differently and you have to look at it more about where people work and where people are getting their stuff delivered and figure out how to solve that logistical nightmare as opposed to where the supply chain is near the interstate and near the rail lines. Well, so is this last mile uh, issue, uh, is that create some opportunities in industrial? Yes. So I think there's going to be a whole new intermediary that locks up all the space that um, in urban areas that will be the owner of the space that the stuff is stored at to make that last mile work. And the thing is, the online retailers have tremendous analytics about what's being bought. They can almost forecast going into a holiday season what goods they need to stick in that um, space. And by the way, they also can drive people to a certain product. So if they put a certain brand of 60 inch flat screen in that space because they projected that the, the sales volume in the next two weeks would be a certain thing and the sale volume isn't there, run a special on it and people will buy it. How many people go to that online retailer and look at the deals of the day, right? So that drives traffic. That's going to be a business. Well, By the way, that is going to be an Emerging Trends Real Estate 2017. Just a little shout out. <laughs> So what's what's all this online sales? Uh, you know, it's benefiting industrial. Uh, it's uh, obviously it's impacting retail real estate. Uh, what do you think about retail moving forward? Um, a couple of things on retail. There's probably three segments of retail. There's the big fortress kind of mall, which is more about experience than anything else. And all the survey work we do in our retail practice revolves around 
people wanting an experience. That's what the mall satisfies the experience. Um, then there's the neighborhood grocery um, pharmacy. And by the way, the drugstore grocery business is all kind of merging into one, um, in, in my view, because milk is cheaper in the CVS than it is in the supermarket. You told me you don't go grocery shopping, right? So you don't know what I'm talking about, Michael. He's just like, I don't, man. He's like glazing over here. Um, so that business is all about rooftops. And since we're sort of repopulating the suburbs with millennials who are moving out, so that whole rooftop business is going to be good. It's the stuff in between that's going to be hurt. So the stuff that sells them in leased um, probably isn't going to get leased and it's probably built in the wrong spot. Um, and the big box retailers, the survival of the fittest has probably already happened there. So as your other frequent guest, who I'm a big fan of from Reese, Ryan Severino says, it's just under demolished. Maybe it's time to start <laughs> demolishing some of that stuff. I have some more questions for you, but uh, we're running a little bit out of time, so I want to see if, if the crowd has any questions. They look smart, so these, they, could, be, these, these could be much better questions than they, yours. They will be. <laughs> they will be. So. Dude in the back, yes. <laughs> Oh, quick, unlike his? <laughs> so, so. So the, so the microphones can hear it. Repurposing malls. What do we do with these obsolete malls? Laser tag. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Um, the, the big million square foot malls that haven't done well in the last couple of years, my guess is, aren't going to do well, right? They, so they certainly need to be repurposed. Um, and experience is the thing that people want from a retail perspective. So it's going to, and I joke and say laser tag, but I'm not totally joking. It's going to be some interactive experience retail thing you can't build a million square foot pop-up store because that's the other answer in a lot of retail so it has to be some experience assuming it's located in the right path of growth and it makes sense that's the answer for that because if the big retailers don't want to be there they would have moved there already the big malls that are doing well uh, will continue to do well and the problem is there's not a lot of market clearing price on those things, but when they do trade, they trade for like the lowest cap rates imaginable, which just seems counterintuitive when you think about the headwinds in the real estate world uh, around retail. Um, but it's just a, a it's total supply and demand because when they trade, the open ended funds can't get enough of that stuff and they they pounce on it. Drone racing, that's what you can do with them, I think. Drum <laughs> racing. Drone. Drones. Drone racing. Race. Some more questions, sir. Yeah. Questions about the future of CMBS, CMBS. CMBS, not CMBS. <laughs> the, I'm tired of waiting for the shoe to drop on maturities in CMBS world. Because like, that's like a story that like I'm just tired of waiting for it. Um, we talked about kicking the cane down the road. The weirdest thing about old vintage pre-financial crisis CMBS, and then I'll talk about the new CMBS 2.0 or 2.1. The old CMBS was really strange because the top of the capital stock and the bottom of the capital stack, which you would think have two completely different agendas, miraculously had the same agenda. The people at the top of the capital stack keep that trust alive forever because I bought bonds that I could never replace today in the market. Okay. Triple A's that traded at, you know, an effective yield of five something. Good luck getting that today. And the bottom of the capital stack were the can down the road kickers and anything that, and often cases, they were also the special servicer. So things that were in trouble, they were getting a special servicing fee for. So some of the people in the middle, as long as there was enough cash in the sequential pay model that exists in the CMBS trust for them to get something, they were still getting something more than they would have gotten. So we've got this weird alignment of interest that prevented the CMBS world from blowing up, and it hasn't. Some of the newer stuff that's been created in, in, in 2.0 um, will either see the exact same fate should we have another economic downturn or the, the structure just made more sense and everybody sort of got what they wanted. Um, 
So I don't see anything shoe dropping happening in the CMBS world because if it was going to happen, it would have happened already. I think there was a question right there, wasn't there? I saw a hand. Yes. I think that's Junior. Yeah. Thoughts on senior living, assisted living? Uh, are you talking Anybody about getting older? me? <laughs> um, I'm not that old. Um, it it fundamentally makes sense because um, baby boomers in the room, if you haven't heard it already, you can hear it for the first time, you're going to live to 100. <laughs> There's no amount of alcohol that you can drink that could stop that from happening. No. Um, but so the bottom line is that if – our generation, baby boomers, are statistically likely going to live to 100. Um, our definition of what senior living and assisted living look like are probably going to change somewhat, right? So the senior living product that exists today and the assisted living product and all the age in place are for the baby boomers' parents' generation. Uh, my dad, God bless him, was 90 years old, right? And he lives completely – he lives in, He lives by himself when he's in Florida during the winter. He's in the New York suburbs during the during the summer, and he's self-sufficient, other than calling me with questions about REITs. <laughs> that was a recall from a joke that got m much better reaction the first time I used it. But um, so I think it makes sense. The problem is I think all the durations are wrong in a lot of the models because – People are living longer, and I don't think we've figured it out. The actuarial world hasn't figured it out. The insurance industry probably hasn't figured it out. The wealth management industry hasn't totally figured it out. But the statistics are just bearing out that people are living longer. So I don't have a good answer other than it, the assisted living, and the, they need to figure out who the target customer is because people are living longer and living independently longer than we thought. Yeah, it seems like they're we're preparing for the demand, but the demand's not there yet. Right. One last question. Sure. So, is zoning for affordable housing how that's impacting cities? I, I, I'm going to answer the question two different ways. I'm going to use the word affordable with a lowercase a. So. Housing affordability is a considerable challenge in this country um, because we do have high demand for housing, but people just can't necessarily afford it because um, we haven't added to supply. We have demand. Prices are going up, and people are just getting priced out of being first-time home buyers. Um, the elected officials look at that and income inequality and a bunch of other what I'll call more political issues, and they look to try to pass legislation to solve some of those problems. Um, and what I'll tell you is no two cities are doing it the same way, but it's a – you asked about elections. It's a great election cycle, whether it's a four-year term or a two-year term or whatever, you know, municipal um, elected officials. It's good campaign trail stuff, so you find a lot of talk about um, things like housing inequality and income inequality, and you have local legislation around the country which varies around that. Um, so – um, I hear it everywhere I go. Um, I haven't necessarily seen a mousetrap that works in one city versus another, but I certainly, in response to your question, I hear it everywhere. One last question from me. Multifamily demand has really been fantastic. I think it's even surprised the, the analyst in the, in the space itself. How long is this going to last? Is it going to continue? So um, I'll give you some – sometimes this gets cheers – so there's a term that economists and real estate analysts use called household formations. Statistically, a household formation is when children move out of their parents' house. Sometimes it get, gets applause, okay? Not, not from this audience. Yay. <laughs> so that's when a household is formed. We have formed um, two and a half million more households than we've, um, del than we've delivered or started um, new um, single and multifamily. So it's as low as two and a half million and it's as high as three and a half million depending on whether or not you look at starts or completions. So that is our demand for housing. And in another interesting data point is the mix of single family versus multifamily has shifted meaningfully over the last couple of years. So we're delivering more multifamily than we have been historically. 
Um, it used to be about um, a quarter of all starts were multi, and now it's about um, a third of the starts are multi. So we're, we're just not catching up to that, all of that demand, uh, and that's why rents are going up. Multifamily rents are going up, and that's why um, housing prices are going up because, again, we're forming households, but we're just not creating supply. So we're at the lowest level of supply of new construction um, and the lowest level of supply of existing homes that we've had in recent history. That just tells me that that demand is there. I think rents are going to continue to go up, and I think housing prices, um, short of interest rate or political, um, uh, socio-political headwind, I think uh, housing prices are going to continue to go up, too, unless we add to supply. Mitch, thank you. Thank um, you all. Thank uh, Mitch for being here. Thank you.